Welcome to my channel. I am not going to be doing music reactions today. I have a different agenda. And if that's not what you're looking for, tune out. What I want to do today is I want to do two things. First, what I want to do is I want to tell you a story about my life and the reason I want to do this is because I've had a lot of people comment on my channel that they really like the fact that I'm soft-spoken and I'm calm. And there's a reason for that. And so I want to delve into the depths of that and explain to you where I'm coming from. And also because I pray at the end of every video and I'm not the least bit afraid to talk about my beliefs, even with atheists on my channel. And so you need to understand where I'm coming from. I say I'm a Christian, but uh, I may not be the kind of Christian that you're used to seeing because uh, most Christians go to church and are involved in a religious denomination, and I am not. Uh, I definitely believe in God, but I am not a, a religious person at all. And that may seem like a contradiction of terms to you, but maybe you'll understand better after I've told you this story. So, a few years ago, my wife and I were involved in a Christian ministry, and we were in a program that we spent a year uh, at a place where we were being taught a lot of different stuff. And one of the activities that we did was something called LEAD, L-E-A-D. It stood for Leadership, Education, Adventure, and Direction. And I'm going to tell you about the program briefly because I want you to understand what happened when we took part in LEAD. The idea behind LEAD was that you would leave the campus in Rome City, Indiana, and you would hitchhike. You'd be dropped off at the interstate, and you would hitchhike from Rome City, Indiana, to Tinney, New Mexico. That's T-I-N-N-I-E, New Mexico. And you had 96 hours to get there. And then you were also each given, wife and husband, $15 each. And you were told that when you returned uh, after 10 days at lead and 96 hours to get back, that you had to return the $30 that you were given. So naturally, this is something that is a topic of conversation between husband and wife. And so we talked about it and we decided that if our God wasn't big enough to replace money that we spent, then he wasn't worth believing in. So we decided, okay, we're just going to go. We're going to do whatever we feel led to do. We're going to spend whatever money we feel led to spend. And God's going to have to replace it somehow. So we took off from, from Indiana. And I'm not going to tell you every single detail of the trip because it's, it's quite long. But I'm going to tell you some of the highlights of it. We caught a ride with a gentleman who was returning to Springfield, Missouri from uh, Michigan where he had picked up his father's old Mercedes Benz that had been parked in the barn for a while. And he picked us up on the side of the road on the interstate in Indiana, asked us where we were going. We told him that we were headed out to Tinney, New Mexico. He said, well, I'm going to Springfield. I can take you that far. And we said, okay, great. And we got in the car. Not too long after we got going, the car broke down. It quit working. And since I have some knowledge of mechanics, I've worked as a mechanic in a previous life, I, I uh, diagnosed that the fuel pump had gone out. And this was on a Saturday afternoon. So finding a fuel pump for a Mercedes Benz would be quite a chore. So what I suggested to him was that we find an electric fuel pump that we could use to get him home and then he could get it fixed properly 
when he got home. And so we did that. We got, we managed to find an electric fuel pump and I got it hooked up and the car started running again. And so he drove us to Springfield. He dropped us off on the side of the road in the middle of the night. By this time, it was about one o'clock in the morning. And it was kind of chilly. It was, uh, I don't remember what month it was, but it was probably like April or May. So it was a little chilly, not too bad, but chilly. And he dropped us off just on the side of the road at the exit that he got off on. We decided to walk to the next exit. So we did. And when we got there, we discovered that it was a, a interchange between two interstates and there was nothing there there was no no restaurants no gas stations no nothing it was just out in the boonies so there we were kind of chilly and we took turns kind of sleeping on the side of the road while the other one was holding their thumb out and not getting any rides after a little while here comes this guy in the mercedes and I thought, what in the world is he doing? Well, he pulled over and he said, you left your wallet in my car. And he handed me a wallet. Oh, and also I forgot to mention, he paid me $20 for fixing his car. So he left and we stood there until about six in the morning. And by this time we were getting kind of chilled to the bone. And a Volkswagen pulled over. Now, any of you who knows anything about Volkswagen Beetles knows that the one thing they didn't have was a good heater system. Well, this guy offered us a ride and we got in and his car was hot. It was nice and warm. And I thought, wow, this is really weird. And he says, where are you going? And we told him where we were headed. And he said, well, I can take you to the first truck stop. Well, the first truck stop was 70 miles west of Springfield. And he drove us all the way there. For that reason, and for the reason that the car was hot instead of cold, and because he told us that he was just driving around because he was bored, and he took us 70 miles, we thought he was probably an angel. Now, you may think of angels as the popular vision of them as people with wings, but angels can take a human form and they can appear to be just a guy or girl and you would never know they're an angel unless they do something. So that's what we thought about him. He dropped us off at the truck stop. We went inside immediately and got hot coffee. And we drank our coffee and we had been told before we left the campus that if we saw a truck with a white dove in the windshield, that was a truck that would pick us up. We were also given some white dove stickers to give to truckers that did give us rides. So we were watching out the window at the trucks pulling into the truck stop. And sure enough, this truck pulls in and he's got a white dove in his windshield. So I excused myself and went outside to ask him for a ride. And when I got to his truck, I looked at the windshield and there was no dove there. And I thought, well, that's really weird. But I asked him for a ride anyway, and he said he was sorry he couldn't do it because of company policy. So we finished our coffee and our breakfast, and then we went out and walked across the bridge and down the entrance ramp, and we stood on the entrance ramp thumbing. And after a while, here comes this trucker. And he's going through the gears like they do, and all of a sudden he hits the brakes. And the door swings open. He says, get in. I can't leave you kids standing on the side of the road. So we got in his truck. Where was he going? Amarillo, Texas. So we were three-fourths of the way home by then. Three-fourths of the way to Tinney. So we rode with him and we talked with him. And he dropped us off in Amarillo. And not too long after that, we caught a ride to... Uh, canyon which is kind of southwest of Amarillo and the guy dropped us off in Canyon and then we caught a ride from Canyon to Roswell New Mexico and this ride was in a trailer that had been hauling cows so there was 
cow dung all over the floor of the trailer. We had to be very careful about where we set our packs down. But he gave us a ride to Roswell, and then there was a person in Roswell who was uh, had been whose name had been given to us, and we were told that we could go there to wash up and and rest up if we needed to. So we went there. We took showers. And then we got back on the road and we caught a ride with another guy hauling cattle. And he took us to Tinney and dropped us off. We got to Tinney about, I think, two or three hours before the deadline. And everybody else was already already there. We were the last ones to arrive. And uh, my wife said, I'm thirsty. And I said, well, there, there was a little... Tinney is like... It, it's a T intersection in, in a rural road, and there is a little building there, at least there was when we were there, uh, that is a combination drugstore, uh, five and dime, and U.S. post office. I don't know what the population of Tinney is, but it can't be very big. This was the only thing that was there. There was nothing else there. So I went into the store, and I got... Uh, uh, knee-high grape soda, because my wife really likes those, or she did back then, and uh, a moon pie, which she also liked. And I came back out and I gave them to her. And one of the other couples came over to us and they said, can we borrow some money from you? We'd like to get something to drink. And I said, well, what happened to your money? They said, well, we put it in our shoes. And I said, well, then spend your own money. You don't have to spend ours. I thought it was interesting that they they didn't want to spend their money because they were afraid they might not be able to get it back, but they were willing to use our money and not worry about whether we got it back. That was interesting to me. So after a little while, a guy came and picked us up, and we went to the lead location, which was up in the mountains in New Mexico. And we... We spent 10 days in the mountains hiking and uh, praying and reading the Bible. And one day we went on this climb and it was, uh, th there were several different climbs that they offered. And I, being the guy that I am, I chose the most difficult one. And there were other people that went ahead of me on that climb and almost all of them fell at some point. Of course, you're tied onto a rope so you don't fall very far, but still, they lost their grip and fell. The last guy to go before me was a friend of mine who was 6'3 and weighed 220 and was, he was so, uh, he had such a, an amazing physique that I called him Adonis. That was my nickname for him. And when I saw him fall several times, I immediately knew I can't do this. There is no way I can do this. So when it came my turn, I walked to the bottom of the cliff, tied the rope around my waist, and then I closed my eyes and I said, God, I have no idea how to do this. You're going to have to show me where to put my hands and feet. And then I started climbing. And I made it all the way to the top without falling once. This climb included what's called a negative overhang. If you've never heard of a negative overhang, it's when the rocks above you jut out over your head, so you literally have to reach behind you to grab the rock to climb over it. It's a very difficult maneuver. It's very easy to fall there, and several people had fallen there. But I made it over that and over everything else and made it to the top without falling once. Of course, I knew why. I asked God to tell me where to put my hands and feet, and he did. And I put my hands and feet there, and bam, I went up the mountain. The next day, we were hiking, and one of the counselors who was walking with us slowed his pace down until I caught up to him. And then he pulls alongside of me, and in a soft voice, he says, So how long have you been climbing? And I said, I've never climbed in my life. This is the first time. And he looks at me and he says, well, you climb that like a pro. I said, well, I know who the pro was. It wasn't me. It was God. 
because I asked God where to put my hands and feet and he told me. He shook his head and he said, well, that's impressive. While we were at LEED, we bought t-shirts that said LEED on them. And on the day that we left, we were taken back down to Tinney and dropped off in front of that little store and told you have 96 hours to get back to Rome City, Indiana. So a guy came by again in a cattle truck with a trailer. Uh, you know, a pickup truck with a cattle trailer is what I mean. And so a whole group of us rode in that. And uh, they took us to Canyon. And everybody caught rides except my wife and I. We didn't catch one. I thought that was really odd. But there we stood on the side of the road in Canyon. And as, the, as night came, the temperature got cooler and cooler. And then it started raining. And so we ran underneath a, um, an abandoned gas station canopy and stood there until the rain stopped. And then we went back out and stuck our thumbs out. Well, about one o'clock in the morning, a sheriff's deputy car rode by. And he came by two or three more times. And finally, the fourth time he came by, he pulled over and he said, you kids look like you're freezing to death. Would you like some hot coffee? And we said, yes. So he took us into the jail. And he said, you're welcome to spend the night here if you want. We don't have any prisoners right now. And my wife says, I'm not telling my friends I spent the night in jail in Canyon, Texas. I said, okay. So we went back out on the side of the road. The deputy took us back out, dropped us off. And since it had been raining, there was a nice like stream of water running down alongside the curb. And here comes a bunch of maggots from some dead animal that was up the road a ways. And we thought, man, how could it get any more miserable? About six o'clock in the morning, we got a ride with a guy. And he took us into town and dropped us off at the McDonald's. So we went into the McDonald's. We got ready to order. And these, uh, a group of elderly ladies were there. There's four of them. And they asked us what we were doing. Because we had our packs and we looked kind of scruffy from 10 days in the woods. And uh, we told them what we were doing. And they said, well, that's really cool. Let us buy you breakfast. So they bought us breakfast. I forgot to tell you that while we stood on the side of the road, I'm sorry, it wasn't Canyon that we were at. It was Hereford, Hereford, Texas, which is a cattle town and smells like it. <laughs> when we were standing on the side of the road in Hereford, my wife says, we should call Paul and Vanji. Paul and Vanji were friends of ours who lived in Amarillo. And I said, no, that would be cheating. Well, that was one of the lessons I learned from that trip was that I was way too religious, too rigid. I didn't have any flexibility at all. And the second one was I should have listened to my wife because when we were at the McDonald's in Canyon, my wife says to me, can we please call Paul and Vanjie? And I said, sure. By that time I was tired and I just wanted to rest for a while. So they came, Vanjie came and picked us up, took us to their house, gave us some food. And then I laid down on the floor and went to sleep. And my wife sat up and talked to Vanjie. Well, after a while, we felt it was time to go. We really needed to get on the road. And so we asked Vanjie if she would drop us off at the interstate. And she said, sure, I'll be glad to. So... She dropped us off, and as she dropped us off, she handed us a bag full of sunflower seeds and other nuts and other stuff to eat. We later found out that in the bottom of the bag was a $20 bill. She never said anything. So we, she dropped us off, we stuck our thumbs out, and in no time at all, we got a ride with a trucker. He was going to Cincinnati, Ohio. So... We rode with him all day. When we got hungry, we offered to buy his lunch, and he accepted. And then when we got to Cincinnati, 
he was picking up a load of butterball turkeys. And when he backed up to the dock, one of the dock workers said, where's your pallets? And he said, well, I don't have any pallets. And this guy, I don't know how old he was, but he looked like he was in his 80s. He, he had shocking white hair, a white mustache. I mean, he looked like he was old. He says, I haven't got any pallets. And they said, well, you're going to have to load your truck this yourself. And he looks at them. He says, do I look like somebody who can load a truck? And then he turns to me. He says, you want to make some money? I said, sure. He says, well, the, the guy at the dock said, well, we'll give you one man to help. So he said, if you'll help that man load the truck, I'll give you $25. So I said, okay. So he gave us 20, he gave me $25 and I helped this man load 80,000 pounds of butterball turkeys into the back of his truck. We pulled away from the dock and his reefer broke. If you don't know what a reefer is, it's the cooler unit that keeps the, the back of the truck below freezing to keep the food frozen. So we had to stop and get that serviced. And he knew that we had a deadline. We had talked about it with him. And he says, where did you say you were going? And we said, Rome City, Indiana. He says, well, I'll tell you what. He says, you've been so good to me, I'll take you there. So he drove us right to the front door of the place. And we got there about 9.30. We were due in by midnight. So we beat the deadline. When we got inside, I went to the receptionist and I said, is everybody else back? And she said, yeah, they're all back. But there's one couple that was short on money. And I said, well, how short were they? And she says, well, they went into town to try and earn some. So I said to the receptionist, we're going to go up to our room. Why don't you call us when they come in and let us know if they're still short? And she says, okay. Now keep in mind, never in this trip once did we ever count our money. We just put it in our pockets and went about our way. We bought meals for the trucker. We bought meals for other people. We bought shirts for ourselves. And people gave us money. But we never counted it. We didn't know how much money we had. So we got up to the room and, and naturally we were pretty tired. So uh, we got undressed, took showers. I put the money on the on the dresser, just laid it down, didn't really look at it. About 11.30, the phone rang. It was the receptionist, and she says, they're back. And I said, well, did they get all their money? And she says, no. And I said, well, how short are they? And she says, they're short $7.10. I'll never forget that number. Because I went and looked at the money that was laying on my dresser, and it was $7.10. The lesson I learned from that was that God will take care of you to the penny. He will take care of every single need you have to the penny. And because of this experience, because I climbed that mountain with God's help, and because we got the rides that we needed to get at the time we needed to get them, and because we had that extra money that was just enough to take care of that other couple, I've never had a single doubt in my mind ever since that God exists and that he cares about me personally as an individual. And I know that he thinks that of everyone, including you. So I wanted to share that story with you because... I think it's inspiring and I think it's proof that God cares and that he exists. Now I've told this story to some people and they've said, oh, that was just all coincidence. No, 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 it's not coincidence. It's not coincidence that I put my hands and my feet in every single right crevice in every single place that they need to be to climb that hill, that cliff without once falling. One side note, one day we did what's called Australian rappelling. If you don't know what that is, during World War II, the Australian Rangers were trained to rappel face first down a cliff. And the reason they were trained that was because if the enemy was at the bottom, they could rappel with one hand and fire their machine guns with the other to protect themselves. So we did Australian rappelling, which is 
I tell you, when you when you first step over the cliff, you're going face first now. Picture yourself leaning over the top of a cliff and you're thinking, oh my God, what am I going to do? But when you take that first step, it's literally like walking on the floor. It, it blew my mind. We literally, Australian rappelled down a cliff. That was just one of the many things that we did on that adventure. But that was what sealed it for me. I was raised in a Christian family and I, I went to church when I was a child. I went to a Christian university. You know, my whole life was centered around Christianity, but not really walking with God. It was after that experience that I realized that I could walk with God personally. So I wanted to share that with you because you think I'm just calm and I'm easygoing and that's just the personality that I have, but it's not at all. It's because of God that I'm this way. I didn't used to be this way. I used to be very anxious, upset, angry all the time. I'm not anymore because I know I don't have anything to worry about. I don't have to worry about my my needs being taken care of. I don't have to worry about my family being hurt. I don't have to worry about anything because God has a hedge of protection around us and he protects us. Now, do we have troubles? Sure, we have troubles. I mean, my wife has had cancer, but we defeated it because of God. I wanted to share this with you because I care about you. And I wanted you to know the source of my calmness and the source of my uh, soft-spokenness. It has nothing to do with me. It's God. God is who made me what I am today. And he can do the same thing for you. And that's my prayer, is that you will learn to walk with God like I have. And I can tell you from personal experience that one thing you can do to help you understand how God cares about you is to challenge him. If, if you're not sure if God is really caring, caring about you, if he really will take care of you, challenge him. Say, God, I need you. I need your help. I need your help with this specific problem. And I need you to help me in a way that I will know beyond a shadow of a doubt that it's you that's helping me and not just luck. Guarantee you God will do it. He's done it for me numerous times in my life. When I'm not sure about something and I, I want to make sure that I'm getting my direction from God, I will challenge him. I need you to show me to myself, prove to me that it's you. Do it in a way that I will not mistake it for anything else but you. And he always does. He can do that for you. And I pray that you will do that, that you will challenge God and you will ask him to come into your life and support you and protect you and keep you safe. And I pray that he does that for every person that you love as well. Because they're important to you. Just as you're important to me. So this is the Vietnam era vet out. <laughs>